those words in our head, let's hear these words from Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. The word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Oh God, we ask this morning that you would help us not simply to be hearers of your word, but that we would be doers of your word. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. So I'm not a big fan of the beach anymore now that I've gotten older because um, now I don't really like going in the water where I can't see my feet and I burn really easily and I don't like feeling hot and sweaty and getting sand everywhere. But when I was a kid, I loved going to the beach because at that point I wasn't afraid of going in the water. And I loved being out there. One of my favorite things to do was to build sand castles. Now, my sand castles were never really any good. They were just kind of lumps of sand that I would dig a boat around. And sometimes I would, I would dig a trail down to the water so when the water would come in, it would kind of come in and, and fill up the moat. But I had a lot of fun building sand castles when I was a kid. Now, of course, it wouldn't be too long before either the tide would come in and wash it away, or sometimes I would, I would um, not be happy with my creation, so I would preemptively destroy it by just kicking it over and, and starting a, a new sand castle. But I've always been impressed with um, those, those sand castle or sand sculpture contests that um, you sometimes see pictures of or that you might see on TV or maybe if you're lucky enough to see in person. And you see these, like, I don't know how they make them stay, um, how they have these elaborate castles or creations that are tall and they have these elaborate designs in them and they look really beautiful and they look really amazing but no matter how amazing or how beautiful they look it's only a matter of time before the tide comes in and washes them away or maybe the wind starts to blow or it starts to rain and ultimately those beautiful creations are washed away as if they've never existed now, when I was a kid, I liked going to the beach for vacation. But these days, I like traveling to various places in the world. And, and I love, love, love seeing places where there is rich history that goes back thousands of years. Nothing quite excites me quite as much as, as seeing an old building or an old cathedral. Or uh, most recently, when we were in Jerusalem, seeing the Temple Mount and the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, and going up to that wall and touching it and knowing these stones have stood for thousands of years and they're still there. I can remember um, going to the ruins of Ephesus in Turkey and, and even though you know there, most of the buildings were largely in ruins, they were still standing structures that had existed for thousands of years. In London, I would go to the Tower of London, which I had just so much fascinating history there, but I would think, this place has stood for over a thousand years. And Westminster Abbey, this huge towering cathedral that has stood throughout history and been a part of so many um, so many moments in British history. All of these structures are built from the rock. Because if you want something that is going to last, 
that is going to endure, it has to be built from rock upon the rock. And so if we come to Jesus' closing words of the Sermon on the Mount today, and he gives this parable and he says, those who hear my words and do my words are like the wise builder who builds upon the rock. But those who only hear and don't put the word into action, they're like the foolish builder who builds upon the sand. As soon as the tide comes, it washes it away as if nothing has ever existed there. And so Jesus closes his Sermon on the Mount with this image. And Jesus has just told us a lot of stuff. Now, we started this series back in June sometime, I think. And so we've been through a lot. It's very rich and dense, this Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus tells us, listen, everything I've told you, I hope that you have not only heard it, but that you are ready to act upon it. And so I want to refresh our memories of everything that Jesus has told us. So if you recall, the Sermon on the Mount starts out with the Beatitudes, with a word of blessing. And that particular Sunday, we talked about the idea of God's unconditional blessing that God gives before anything else that before, God even, before Jesus even starts talking about how we're to live, he says, first, I want you to know that you are loved, that you are blessed, that you are valuable in God's sight. If we are to hear that and make that our own, let that dwell in our hearts, then that should change how we see ourselves in relationship to God and ourselves in relationship to one another. Because if God loves us first, if God loves us unconditionally and offers us a blessing before anything else, then what do we have to fear? What do we have to worry about? What do we have to doubt about God's love for us? But if we hear those words, that also changes how we look and treat one another. Because if we recognize the same blessing God has extended to us is extended to all, then that changes how we look at and treat our neighbor, recognizing that they are given the same blessing that God gives to us. We're to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. After, after the Beatitudes, Jesus then goes on to use these metaphors of salt and of light. And as followers of Jesus, we are to be salt and light. We are to be witnesses. We are to extend the grace of Jesus Christ to those around us through um, the image of salt. Uh, we spread the salt around to preserve, to give hope, to sustain. We are called to sustain those around us, to salt the world with the hope of Christ. And we're called to be lights. We're called not to hide under a bushel and, you know, just do our Christian thing on Sunday mornings, but we are called to be light, to be reflections of Christ's light wherever we are. We cannot simply be hearers of the word. We must be doers of the word. <clears throat> And then Jesus goes on this, this kind of extended section of talking about how we are to be in relationship with one another. He talks about what we do when we're angry with a brother or a sister. He talks about the kind of um, relationships that we are to strive for, the kind of covenant we are to establish with one another in marriage and friendship. He talks about how we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. He talks about caring for the most vulnerable, providing for the needy. Jesus gives us a clear picture 
of our what our relationships with others are to be, and that it, they're not to be about serving self or whatever fits us best or whatever is convenient, but rather they're to be characterized by sacrificial love of giving of ourself, of our resources, of what we have for our family, for our friends, for our neighbors, and even for our enemies. And Jesus says, don't just hear those words, live those words. He moves on to talk about prayer and the content of our prayers. If you can remember the week that we talked about the Lord's Prayer, and we focused on the idea of praying, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. You know, we're not just here on earth waiting for God to do God's thing. Say, all right, God, show up and bring your kingdom to earth. We're just going to sit here and twiddle our thumbs while we wait. No, we are called to be workers for God in bringing about His kingdom, to be co-workers with we're not simply to be hearers of the words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're to be people who act in such a way to help bring about that kingdom of faith and hope and love. And we move on, and, and, it, and Jesus just goes on, and he continues about talking about where is our treasure? Where, where are our priorities? What do we truly worship? Is it money? Is it material things? Is it... Is it um, is it our own success? Is it how well we are liked by others? Or is it the things of God? Where our treasure is, there our heart will be. And while you're at it, don't worry about those things that might feel difficult in life. Don't spend your time resting or dwelling in anxiety, but rather trust that I am with you always and that I will provide for your needs. How hard is it to be a doer of that word? I know that's where I struggle a little bit since I'm prone towards anxiety. I hear those words, but it is hard for me to put those words into practice and to fully trust that Christ has got it under control and that Christ is with me. And then he continues on and talks about our judgment versus God's judgment. And Jesus reminds us, judge not lest you be judged. God is the judge. We're not here to judge one another. That's Jesus' job. We're not here to condemn one another. We're not here to point the finger at other people. That's Jesus' job and not ours. And Jesus is the one who can correct us when we go astray. But how hard, how hard is that one too, to not judge others? That's a, that's a pretty strong temptation, but be hearers and doers of the word. And finally, the Sermon on the Mount ends with this section on talking about false teaching and bearing good fruit. And Jesus warns us that there are all kinds of teachings out there that might lead us away from the path of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's less obvious. Sometimes there are subtle ideas that work its way into our faith that lead us to think, well, my faith should be about being comfortable. My faith should mean I always have wealth or security. But Jesus says, no, be aware. Be aware of the things which pull us away from the things of God. And ultimately, our lives, our lives should bear the fruit of faith. It's not the fruit that saves us. It's not our works that save us, but rather they are a sign of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. 
Good fruit is a sign that we have heard the word and put it into practice. And so then we're back to where we find ourselves today with Jesus offering this closing metaphor of building on the rock versus building on the sand. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount is really a design for life. For us. It's not some like legalistic law that we have to follow, but rather it's the life, it's the model that Jesus lays out for us, that he himself lives and says to us, this is the way as my people that you are called to live. This is the way of life as I have intended it for you. We know in scripture where Jesus talks about, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shows us what it is like to live, to participate in that abundant life. You know, Jesus, Jesus lays the foundation for us here. And in fact, Jesus himself is the foundation. If you know anything about masonry, which is, is, is a little bit less common today with the way modern buildings are built, but um, if you look at the way that, for instance, cathedrals have been built throughout history, um, there's a foundation that has to be dug. It has to go down pretty deep. In fact, you have to dig a really deep foundation if you're gonna have a tall tower. You may never see the foundation, but if that tower is going to withstand earthquakes or storms or whatever else is coming, that foundation has got to go down deep into the earth. But once that foundation is dug, the very first stone that is laid is the cornerstone. And the cornerstone is one of the most important stones in a building because it determines where the foundation begins. It determines the, the direction in which the whole foundation will be laid out. All of the other stones in the foundation and the whole structure itself have to come into alignment with the cornerstone. I mean, really, the cornerstone determines the position and the strength of the whole structure. And so Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Because not only are these words of the Sermon of the Mount words that Jesus speaks, they're the words that he lives. They're the words that he embodies. And so when, when he says, build your house on the rock, he's telling all of us that if we want to stand firm in our faith and in God's kingdom, then we must come into alignment with the cornerstone, who is Jesus Christ. You can't skimp on a foundation if you want your structure to last. You can't just sort of write it off and, and cheat and, and dig it more shallowly to, to save money or time or convenience. You have to dig it deep. You have to act on the word in which you have heard. And this is kind of a, a silly example, but you know, imagine going to the doctor and your doctor has some advice for you on what you need to do to change some patterns in your life. For instance, I, I was at a regular visit with my OBGYN this past weekend, and I knew that I was gaining weight too fast. And I, you know, I kind of knew this, and I knew what I needed to do. Like, I could hear the words in my head of, of, of what I needed to do. And I've been having a sore back. And so I talked to my doctor about it. I said, you know, my back's still really hurting. And I know, I know my weight's getting away from me. Could you help me? And I basically told him, I said, please lecture me right now on all of the bad things that can happen if I don't get my weight in check. <laughs> because I needed some extra motivation. And so very graciously and kindly, 
he, he laid out um, some things for me that I needed to have an understanding of. And then he also laid out for me some strategies on how I might deal with my sore back and getting my weight back under control, strategies, you know, about like what kinds of food I should have on me and, and, and how to deal with the fact that I tend to eat on the run a lot and so I'm not very good about preparing meals ahead of time. And, and so I came away and I heard some really good and helpful things from my doctor. But that doesn't mean a thing if I don't actually act on the word that I have heard. If I don't act on the word that I have heard, then my back's going to keep hurting. I'm going to keep sleeping poorly at night, which may well happen anyway. But I'm going to keep sleeping poorly. I'm going to be uncomfortable. And if I keep gaining weight at the rate that I've been gaining, that's potential complications for the birth itself. And so I am going to act on the word that I have been given because it would be foolish of me if I didn't. And Jesus says the exact same thing. I have given you the words and I am showing you the way. It would be foolish of you not to take these words to heart and to act upon them. Jesus, Jesus is our cornerstone. Jesus is our foundation. Now there's also another stone that's really important in the building of any structure, and that's the capstone. And there are some places where Jesus is referred to as the capstone. So he's the cornerstone, the foundation, the stone on which, which we are called into alignment with. But he's also the capstone, and the capstone is the last stone to be placed in a structure. Once the capstone is in place, the structure is stable. You don't need to add anything else to it. The capstone is what keeps the whole thing together. And so Jesus Christ is not only our cornerstone, he is our capstone. And this is good news because when we look at the Sermon on the Mount and we recognize the challenge to the life we are called to, it can be overwhelming and there are times where we screw up and we start to crumble a little bit. But Jesus Christ is the capstone, is the one who holds it together for us. The capstone is the one who makes it possible for us to keep it together. The capstone is the one who offers the mortar of grace that we may continually be built into the building, to the structure, to that which God intends for us to be. And we started the Sermon on the Mount with a word of blessing, of unconditional blessing of God saying, I love you, you are blessed, and I'm giving this blessing to you before you've given anything in return to me, and I don't expect that. He ends the Sermon on the Mount, after all of these challenging words, with hope and with grace and saying, I am your foundation and I will hold you together through all of these things when you fail, when you fail to do the word that you've heard, my grace is still here. My grace is ever working in you. And so I encourage you and I challenge you, now that we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, not just to kind of leave it behind and say, well, we've read that, we've done that, but to continue to study it and to ask Jesus Christ to imprint those words upon your heart so that those words may overflow in action in our lives so that we bring ourselves fully into alignment with Jesus Christ, but at the same time realizing when we fail, Jesus Christ's grace is still present and working in us and can do the work even when we think it is impossible. We need Jesus' grace to hold us together 
and to make us new so that we stand not like the little sand castles that I would make as a kid, but so that we can stand firm like the wall of the Temple Mount that has been an enduring structure, standing firm, standing strong in the ways of Jesus Christ.